but <laughs> okay. okay. Are you rolling? I am rolling. Okay. okay. Right. Should I look at you? Yes. Okay. Okay. I will this look at you. Just the con- in fact, slide over a little. This one. Yeah, you're just I'm sorry I have a glass eye, so it, it goes in one direction okay. and I talk in the other, but I just Don't wanted to about warn it. you about that. So. Okay. okay. Oh, now I can see it. Okay, oh, good. Uh, now, all right, so tell, tell me uh, who you are. Oh, well, there's the refrigerator. You know, stop. It's our guarantee. Uh, <laughs> you're right. That's and amazing. As soon as we do something. Oh, yeah. okay. So go ahead. Okay, uh, my name is David Hogue. I'm the head of the archives of the Freer and Sackler Galleries in the Smithsonian Institution. I'm currently packing up the remaining papers of James Cahill uh, to be added to the larger group that he gave to us um, years ago, and which we've been adding since. Uh, what, what can you uh, reconstruct for us about Cahill's relationship with the Freer? Um, he wasn't there for many years, I think about uh, um, seven or eight, but his impact at the Freer was enormous. He came with a lot of energy, worked very closely with the director, John Pope, to really further the Chinese art scholarship at the Freer and um, traveled a great deal, made tremendous ties with dealers and scholars in Japan and in China. So um, it was it was a tremendous impact. He also was um, extraordinarily important in recording the goings on of the Freer Gallery at the time. He, he recorded his impressions in his letters and observations. And um, because we were so bad in our early days of keeping our own institutional history, his papers have come to be recognized as very important as we try to reconstruct that era. Is, uh, is, is there some pretty wild stuff in those papers? Oh yes, he loved, he of course had this tremendous sense of humor and constantly made um, jokes about, to, uh, about his fellow um, uh, staff at the Freer in a good natured way. Um, they, yes, he, he loved a, a good party and he loved a good debate. He was very close with John Pope, who I think tried to um, moderate his, his um, exuberance, but um, overall, um, he really did infuse a great deal of energy and um, knew a lot of the other scholars there whose papers were also collecting. And um, because he corresponded with them so much, traveled with them, debated with them, uh, attended their um, their presentations, and, and uh, so he went well beyond his own focus on Chinese art. Uh, any I'm going to pause for just one second. Okay. Uh, any um, anecdotes that you heard uh, or that you could remember from other people? Oh, many. Um, gosh, let me think about that a moment. Um, anecdotes. Um, obviously, he um, very famously painted a series of um, remembrances of Mr. Butts, who was one of the um, collections management staff who was retiring in, I think, the early 60s. And um, he recently showed those to us, which were um, quite wonderful because they um, expressed the goings on of, of Cahill, uh, of, of the Freer. Um, one that very famously shows a group of tuxedo-clad staff carrying um, Chinese art treasures through a tunnel, which apparently connected the Freer with the Smithsonian Castle, because, of course, the Freer bequest stipulated that nothing could leave the Freer Gallery once it was in, while the Smithsonian regents were required to view the past year's um, acquisitions on an annual basis. So they, they um, uh, got around that by building a tunnel through uh, from the Freer to the Smithsonian Castle. So um, absolutely nobody knew about this uh, until Cahill shared this with us at his, uh, at the Freer Medal. Photographs. Drawings, he actually was a fairly accomplished painter and not um, extremely good, but uh, he had a nice uh, touch.
Do you have these drawings? We do at the Freer. Uh, I've got some copies somewhere here, but I can't seem to, to so locate we, them. We can get digital copies. Absolutely, from yes. Because yeah. we have another version of that story, I think, from mm -hmm. Jerome Silverfield. Yes, I think he was there. It actually implied that the tunnel existed and it was just yeah. utilized. They yes. He said they didn't dig it, but they had Actually, we've been looking at that. It was originally just a um, steam and water and plumbing tunnel, and it was quite short, actually. It's only about five feet tall, so people had to hunch to get through it. Um, uh, I've been looking at blueprints recently, and unfortunately, it's been filled in now, and it's no longer used, but um, it's a fat fantastic p piece of our own history. You mean it's not the one that Abraham Lincoln escaped through? No, unfortunately. Uh, the Freer uh, opened in 1923. And so it wasn't there? No, it wasn't. But um, still, the, the, the whole Smithsonian uh, National Mall is, um, is a, a honeycomb of tunnels that, um, for, for various purposes. So we are all connected. And most of the tourists don't see that. So. But oh. Cahill was very observant. So. Okay, so uh, any, any other stories about his well, uh, time there? Yes, he and John Pope and Ashwin Lippi, who was a scholar associated with the Metropolitan, were very instrumental in the early 60s in developing the Chinese Masterpieces exhibition that was shown at the National Gallery and traveled around. It was the first introduction to American viewers of the great painting treasures of the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. That was an extraordinarily instrumental exhibition and um, created a, a real presence for Chinese art in the United States at that time. Uh, do you know about the the film that was being that was made uh, with that palace museum? I don't. I'm afraid I don't know much about it. Um, we, right now, we are, have the Pope Papers and we have the Lippi Papers, which was a recent acquisition. So I think eventually we will have a full um, manuscript-based recording of that entire event. In particular, they're traveling to Taiwan and working with scholars directly in making, in choosing which objects were to be shown and then um, Build, developing captions and text around that. So, so what, are the, what are the papers that you're actually taking to the career from, from Berkeley? Primarily, these are things that uh, were developed after Cahill um, gave us the first set about 10 years ago. But there's also a lot of material that um, I'm discovering from his very early career. Uh, in fact, some things that I just discovered from his own graduate school work, which is really important in trying to piece together the evolution of his own um, scholarly methodology, even if it's not necessarily Chinese. Could you get into any detail on that? Or I haven't had a chance to look at it, but um, I am looking forward to it. Um, he was, even then, um, uh, These are if these are just term papers, they're big and um, very neatly done. And uh, he was a very focused scholar from the very beginning, um, incredibly prolific. The sheer amount of material that's going into the um, James Cahill papers is astonishing, nothing like I've ever seen before. We've worked with a number of important scholars throughout the 20th century. This is by far the largest mass of material we've brought focused on one particular scholar's output. Nothing else compares. It's, it's quite amazing. Really? Yeah. yeah. He's quite, he was quite unique and just in terms of how much he liked to put onto paper. Um, and I understand a lot of the graduate students at UC Berkeley routinely assisted him with maintaining this. So um, it was obviously a joint effort. Any other stories that you heard about his presence there? Um, I have to think about that. I'm sorry, nothing's coming to mind right now. Uh, what was sorry. it that you were talking about that you wanted on? film that you sure it was a great it was a great line okay. start up again because i stopped okay and don't look at me okay no I, I think it was um if i can remember it no it was just about his contribution to our understanding of the history of the freer because he recorded so much and um, he kept all of that unlike us we tended to throw things away which we thought were not necessarily important but 
which in hindsight is un it's unfortunate that we did throw a lot away. So we are working very hard to piece together our own history and Cahill's position in that is really quite valuable. Can, can you talk about the Freer's uh, stature in terms of Asian art? Of course, we are the National Museum of Asian Art uh, with the Freer Gallery, which opened in 1923 based on Charles Freer's um, own collecting from the 1880s through his death in 1919. That was subsequently added to in the mid-80s by Arthur M. Sackler, who um, was responsible for, building, for uh, giving us more material, but also installing a new wing, uh, the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. Um, the Freer Gallery is sort of a jewel of the finest quality available in the late 19th and early 20th century in Asian and Middle Eastern art. Um, while the Sackler, um, although it doesn't have any particular pieces that, that uh, are national treasure quality, is a much more interesting place because of um, its ability to lend and borrow and combine uh, collections and to, to show much more interesting and uh, engaging exhibitions while the freer is more cont contemplative and um, allows people to have direct access to these, these really extraordinary pieces. In, what what in, did Jim Cahill bring to the freer? He, um, he did do a lot of purchasing. He spent a lot of time uh, working on the bronzes, uh, which are very important. Um, God, what else did he do? And of course, he, he traveled a lot and met a lot of dealers in Japan who uh, were very helpful in, in acquisitions and just in developing close ties. Um, he was uh, an incredible gadfly and um, had very quickly developed wonderful relations with other scholars uh, throughout the country who he was able to access you know, when he was doing his own research on freer materials. So yeah, he brought a lot, you know, if you look at his, at our registrarial records, you can see a lot of comments by Cahill about pieces in our collection. So he really was doing a lot of groundbreaking research just in, in um, the connoisseurship of our collections. Okay. Um, did you ever get to know him? I did when he, I've, I've been in touch with him for a number of years and uh, actually saw him in, in a lecture in the early 80s when I was a graduate student, or excuse me, mid-80s when I was a graduate student. But um, when he came for the Freer Medal, he was um, at that time quite frail, and it was my job to wheel him around in his wheelchair and to take him to his hotel and back and such. Um, I say he was frail, um, rather tired from the trip, and uh, I remember being very concerned because he was supposed to give a presentation uh, following the um, following the the ceremony of uh, the Freer Medal, and I remember thinking he would probably stand up and just give general thank you very much, uh, I appreciate it, and then sit back down. He stood up for I'd say a full forty five minutes and had the audience in the palm of his hand. He was a natural showman, uh, born to the lectern. He was an absolute, um, he, he gave a fabulously well-constructed presentation about the um, history of the Freer, his own experiences there, and the, the larger context of the Freer in Chinese art study. And um, peppered it with fabulous jokes that had everybody roaring. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, Absolutely fantastic presentation. Can you can you tell me what the Freer Medal is and how and why it was awarded to him? The Freer Medal has been given sporadically to those um, scholars who had particular impact in the field of Asian art history. Um, it's been rather quiet. I think the last one was given about ten years prior, um, and, but it was. Um, recognized that Cahill was um, both elderly and uh, his impact was universally recognized. And so we decided to dust off the Freer Medal tradition and to present that to, to Cahill, which in hindsight was a, a fantastic judgment. What year was that? 
19 or 2010 I think 2010 2010 or 2011 I'm sorry I don't recall do you, have, my head. do you have still photos of that uh, event I don't but some people will that, that's yeah. a fair yeah so yeah. I mean, we, can, we can get some stills to sure. illustrate your story yeah um, okay uh, Skip anything I, you know I think we have everything that we can okay. ask for from you maybe a little bit of more about sort of um, talking about the the going through his materials and the kind of the vastness of it all mm -hmm. and your process of trying to select the the things that would matter. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, the, he had such broad ranging interests and so many um, irons in the fire at any particular time just to disuntangle all of the things that were going on. And how much was being recorded is really quite uh, an obstacle. But nevertheless, the Freer Archives is really dedicated to collecting manuscripts and original materials that document the advent and evolution of Asian art history as a discipline. So we collect the papers of scholars, archaeologists, dealers, collectors, anybody involved in that enterprise. Cahill's position is um, unmatched in terms of late 20th century scholarship, not only in China, but in Japan and uh, within the broad context of the community. He knew everybody. He communicated with everybody. He argued. He debated. He um, presented, supported, um, was absolutely essential to um, a whole generation of scholars, uh, particularly those people like himself who um, studied under Max Lohr in, at University of Michigan and then at Harvard. Um, he was Max Lohr's first student at uh, University of Michigan and um, a whole raft of others came with him, but I think Cahill really stands out as his first student in many ways. Um, did, did you also, does the Fleur also have the uh, Sherman Lee papers? We don't, those were given to, actually the Archives of American Art I believe has those, which is also part of the Smithsonian. I could be wrong on that. Don't, how, don't quote me on that. I, how is the, how is the fear, uh, part of the Smithsonian? I don't understand that. The Smithsonian is a federation of various museums. Um, the Central Smithsonian uh, opened in the 1850s as a, you may know this as the, a center for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. In 1904, when Freer first offered his collection, it was the first collection of art in any context to the Smithsonian, which up to that time was primarily scientific and ethnographic in focus. Um, it took the Congress a long time to decide, and finally the President, Theodore Roosevelt, stepped in and demanded that it be accepted uh, on, as a whole. Uh, I think in many ways, in response to the growing awareness that Asia was uh, an important trading partner, an important geopolitical locus for the um, for the United States. Um, the Freer was the first museum that was separate from the Smithsonian physically. The Smithsonian Castle was the center and then the, Smithsonian, the Freer was built next to it. But since then we've added a number of other museums, uh, American history, natural history, African art, um, and we continue to grow. Any very, you, you, he'll ask, you know, talk to him, but any um, discoveries that you've gone through his stuff of unique things that maybe aren't part of what you need, but are interesting things to have discovered? Yeah, um, he, um, I actually, I just discovered some of his early University of Michigan graduate school papers which uh, don't have anything to do with uh, Chinese art. I think he gradually evolved to that, but had to get through other professors first. But they are um, an interesting view of his evolving methodologies. Um, other stuff, nothing that comes to mind, but uh, there are always surprises. Um, no librettos? Librettos, yes. He, he, was an insatiable intellect and was interested in movies and music and everything else you can imagine. Where our focus obviously is on Cahill the scholar, but Cahill the artist, Cahill the music aficionado, um, 
it just goes on and on. It's going to take a long time to sep untangle all of those, but uh, it's, it's quite wonderful, particularly in context of the other scholars' papers who were associated with him that were collecting as well. Um, it really gives us the opportunity to be a center of scholarship on the historiography of Asian art throughout the 20th century. It's, it's a real crown jewel. Surprisingly, well, which is what the, your, um, you had mentioned in conversation to us about the Chinese. And so is there some way to, to discuss or state in some simple way the impact he ha had on uh, Chinese painting in China? Um, boy, not from my worm's eye view. I'm, yeah. I'm really not a specialist, but I do know that a lot of his uh, major books were translated into Chinese and that most Chinese scholars recognize him by his Chinese name. Um, and he, of course, had many, many contacts in, in China and I traveled there extensively following the opening up after the Cultural Revolution and established long, long ties that um, are still sustained. Nothing that I have the authority to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already skirting the edge here. So. Right. Right. Are you getting a, a, going through his papers? Are you mm -hmm. getting a picture of the man? Uh, yes, it's funny. When I first saw him in a, uh, he he visited uh, my graduate school in the late '80s and gave a presentation. And um, again, he was a fabulous speaker. You, he came into the room and, and seemed to have this extraordinary charisma and magnetism and everybody sort of went quiet. The great man had arrived, but um, he was also an incredibly warm individual who um, remembered individuals and was not a haughty and austere and proud scholar that you would come to expect, but uh, very earthy. Earthy, you said? Earthy. Down to earth, I guess, but earthy in, in many ways too. He loved a good laugh. Uh, he loved a good party. Um, he loved to travel, meet people, see things. Yeah, he was. Um, he loved life, no question. Any more about his ability to remember people and where you know from that he had met <sighs> so many years ago or something. I'm sorry, nothing That's comes right. to mind. I do remember when he was in Washington to accept the medal, throwing names at him from our own past and him remembering them quite well. Um, he was also very much engaged in the larger community. Uh, he was a gossip and loved to talk about who was doing what and what quality he felt they were. Uh, very opinionated, very man of very strong convictions, um, sometimes passionate to the point of being contentious and argumentative, but always able to step aside and maintain a friendship in spite of fundamental scholarly disagreements. That, I think, is a special gift. Uh, that brings us to Barnhart. Okay. Yes, yes, of course. Can you talk about that relationship? Well, Barnhart and he famously um, argued over a number of scholarly topics related to Chinese painting, um, their um, communications by letter were sharp, sometimes um, rather, rather hard-edged, but I think they maintained a certain degree of respect, which I think is an extraordinary model when you think of most scholars as being rather uh, having fra of one most most scholars of having rather fragile egos, um, he was able to really step into the ring and and maintain his his point of view without being coming alienated and and bitter toward people. That's quite amazing <laughs> uh, in my experience with with academia. You mean most academics have thin skins? I wouldn't say that, but there is a certain reputation among academics. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's great. Okay. okay. This is, thank you so sure. much.